Good evening, Harrison Baptist Church family and community. We are so excited to uh, be, get to come together with you, to pray together tonight, to look together at God's Word, and uh, just to uh, to be together uh, in the only ways we can these days. Uh, well, we're looking forward to uh, to getting into the, the plans of, of when we can come back together. Just tell you a quick little bit about that before we open in prayer. Uh, as we've mentioned before in the last week or so, um, our, our deacons and I have decided that the best way for us to do this as schools are about to start in, and as we're hearing all kinds of different stuff about school starting and what that means for outbreaks and, and spread in the, in the communities of, of those schools uh, all over the country right now, uh, we were looking to let the schools kind of give us a, a little bit of guidance and seeing you know, the situation that will come about in the schools. We're praying for uh, zero outbreak. We're, we're praying for zero transmission of, of COVID uh, and, and, and no you know issues at all. We're hoping and praying for a great school year, but we're also cautiously walking into this knowing that, uh, that the possibility is there. And so uh, we're going to be about two to three weeks behind what our schools are doing. So with our public schools opening um, this coming Monday on August 17th and uh, doing the things that they're doing and the precautions that they're taking, uh, we will be waiting until our, our Sunday, um, uh, first Sunday of September deacons meeting to, uh, to make our plans for when we'll reopen. Uh, at this point, uh, the target date, the, uh, the, uh, the earliest I believe that we'll be able to, to start having our worship services together again would be around September 20th, that Sunday. That gives us a couple of weeks to get ready and to uh, make sure we do everything we need to do in our building to uh, our buildings to, to welcome people back in and, and work with things like Sunday school classes and things like that as far as what might open up. Uh, but don't uh, don't don't hear me saying that we are absolutely opening September 20th. There's a lot that's going to happen and a lot that could happen that would change that date between now, you know, August 12th and uh, and, and over a month away from now. So. Pray with us, though, that uh, that the Lord would uh, would spare us in, in that way and, and would allow us to uh, to get back together in person. Just wanted to give you that quick word. We're uh, we're still day by day. We're thankful for lower numbers of cases in many days over the last several days here in our state. Uh, that's definitely a beginning. And as our governor said yesterday, uh, so much of that is because of the people that are, are doing as they've been asked to do. Uh, some people are so you know into the debate, and you may be too. And if if so, I'm not trying to to offend you in any way, but some people are so into the debate about what we should be able to do, shouldn't be able to do, have the right to do, have the right not to do. Uh, the question right now to me is, is what can we do to make it better? And, and in a lot of ways, because of what we're seeing with the numbers, it seems like many people in our state are doing the best they can, the best we can, to, uh, to keep those numbers down. So uh, that's all we can do. That's all we can ask. If uh, you know, Of course, the first thing we do is pray, but then also if we pray without letting God change our actions uh, in, in whatever way he would guide us to do to, uh, to, to be instrumental in him answering our prayers, then, uh, then you know, we're only doing half of what we need to do, uh, maybe less than that. So uh, the, the idea there is to keep doing the right things, keep doing the things that, that are sacrificial, that are different, that are far from our norm, but keep doing the things that will help keep the spread of this disease from happening. And uh, the more we do that, I know that so many people have said the more we do that, the, the sooner we can get our kids back in school, and that's important. Many people have said that the more we do that, the sooner we can have college football, and that's a big de debate right now this, this week, and all kinds of news coming about, out about that. Uh, but, but that's another goal, and, and uh, for a lot of us, that's a big goal. But, uh, but also, to me, one of the biggest goals, uh, at least for where our church family is concerned, where I am concerned as a, as a pastor, is the more we do that, the more our state does that, the sooner we can meet again in person. So we're excited about how God will lead us in that direction. We want to keep you uh, informed as best we can and, uh, and just, uh, just pray that day by day our state will be getting better and that will set up a, a position for us to be able to meet again more safely and more quickly in person. Let's go to the Lord in prayer uh, this evening before we talk about our prayer list and uh, move into a little time to study from his word. Father, we love you. Lord God, we are so thankful, Father, for all that you're doing in each of our lives. God, help us to be, uh, uh, to be aware and to be vigilant of, of what you are doing, to be looking for you in our lives each and every day because you promise that you are with us and we, you promise that you are working. And God, we want to see it. We want to see you doing the things that only you can do in our lives. And Father, we don't want to miss it. And we want to see it. We want to praise you. And we want to revel in your glory, God, because you are great. You are holy. You are perfect and you are good. So, Lord God, help us to be that way. God, as we, uh, as we lift up those who are on our prayer lists and, Father, the situations that, uh, that so many people are going through, asking your uh, intervention and, and your will in each of these situations for each of these people, Father God, would you help us to, uh, to, to pray earnestly, selflessly, and, uh, and, and, and fervently for those who are, are struggling. And, uh, Father, help us to celebrate the praises that we have for you 
with equal energy and with equal excitement and enthusiasm. Lord, we love you. And uh, Father, we lift up this time even of the discussion of our prayer list and those that are on it uh, as, a, as an act of worship to you and an act of trust in you, that your will is good and that we ask you to do it in each of these per people's lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, many of you uh, heard, maybe you heard Sunday night uh, when we were broadcasting the Bible study. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of you heard other ways, and, and I know a lot of you have been already supporting Mr. J.P. Deer. Uh, he had a tractor accident Sunday morning. He said last night, well, maybe I shouldn't have been on my tractor on Sunday morning. I told him, I said, Mr. J.P., all our days are different these days, so it's okay. No worries there. Uh, but he has a, a very significant injury uh, to his uh, lower arm and uh, from his elbow to his wrist. He's all wrapped up. Uh, he did go yesterday, or excuse me, he did go this morning uh, to uh, to the doctor. They evaluated him. They're going to keep him overnight, um, and uh, and then they're going to do surgery for him in the morning. So uh, we want to be praying. Uh, nobody wants to be in the hospital this time, as we talked about before. Uh, and, and it's no fun when you can't have visitors. It's no fun when you can't have visitors, but it makes it even worse when you can't have visitors and things like that. Uh, so we want to pray for Mr. JP that he'll uh, get a little rest tonight and then pray for tomorrow morning and, and to remember to pray tomorrow morning as well that uh, his surgery will go well. Um, Eric said that they're treating his injury um, in, in, in just kind of like a, a bad deep burn. Uh, so they'll be doing skin grafts and things like that. But lift up Mr. JP, lift up Miss Betty as well. Uh, this is confusing to her, I'm sure. Um, and uh, But lift up the family, Eric and Karen and Chet and, and, and all the others that are helping uh, minister to each part of the family there. And uh, pray that Mr. JP's surgery goes well and his, his recovery is quick and, uh, and total. Uh, also, got some good news about Miss Bobby Godby. She's doing better. Um, the, the doctor is very optimistic, and, and, and I, the word I saw in the in the, the message that came to me was uh, that they're certain that she'll survive this. And boy, that's a that's a huge bit of good news. Anytime we can get that, but certainly as sick as Miss Bobby Godby's been with COVID, uh, that is a, a very uh, very on time answer to prayer. And uh, and so we're very thankful for that. Uh, she still has got a lot of steps to go, so she's still very weak and, and still uh, just trying. To, uh, to, to get better. So pray for her continued improvement and uh, she's going to have some rehab, a, a, a pretty significantly long stay in rehab uh, once she gets finished with the treatment she's getting now. So lift her up in that rehab time. That's going to be more time without visitors again as so many people are experiencing now. Uh, pray for her spirits but continue to pray for the healing of her body. Uh, we want to continue to lift, lift up Miss Judy Grantham. We've been praying so hard for her, and we'll continue to pray hard together for her. Um, she's in that situation where there's no one around, um, and, and in her, her physical and health state, uh, that's, that's been very, very uh, difficult. Uh, that's not the right word there, but it's, it's just been very taxing for her, uh, very confusing for her, and very stressful for her. Um, and so pray for Miss Judy that, that, that one, she's for where she needs to be and be thankful for that and thank the Lord for that. But pray that she is, uh, so that she is encouraged and that God will calm her stress and, uh, and allow some of this rehab that she's doing and treatment that she's receiving to be effective in her body. Uh, Miss Jean is doing a little bit better. Of course, we know Miss Jean has got a lot of hurdles in front of her, but she's, she's jumping over them uh, one at a time. Uh, and some seem to be small hurdles, some are large hurdles. But uh, the, uh, Jason was telling me this afternoon that her appetite is doing better, so she's able to eat a little bit more, and that will only help her uh, in her energy and her strength. Uh, but she, like Miss Judy and like so many others, have, have got a long road ahead of her. But uh, we're praying for one step at a time, for one bit of improvement at a time. And, uh, and knowing that the Lord, is, uh, he doesn't always work in one fell swoop. Uh, many times he works along the process of healing us and growing us and bringing us back to health. So we want to continue to pray for Miss Jean and with both of them. We want to pray for Jill as she looks after both of her sisters that she and we all love so much. Uh, but also for, for Jason and for Eli and for the rest of the family, for Mr. Doug, uh, with, with those two sweet sisters that, that, and their extended family. Uh, we want to pray for them as well. Uh, very thankful to see that on, on the uh, prayer list, if you're accessing it there, you, if you haven't checked it out yet, you can look at it there at the post before this one. Uh, but Miss Chris Price had, a, had a, a procedure last week and, and everything went well. They uh, took a, a, a spot off her hand and, and uh, they're, they're waiting to hear back on the results from that. But Miss Chris is Miss Chris. She's doing fine and she's, uh, she's, uh, she's, she's tougher than I am and tougher than most. So she's, uh, she's making it through. We continue to pray for her as she recovers and pray for those results that they'll come back to be benign, to be, ne to be nothing and, and, and nothing that will cause her any more problem. And if it doesn't, then pray that God's will will be worked. And, and, I'm, and, and in talking to Miss Chris, that's how she feels about it. She's absolutely believing that God's will is God's will and she's gonna follow it. So 
thankful for her spirit and, and her heart uh, even going, in, going through something like this. Um, we're encouraged to hear that Marley Neely is doing well. Um, she still has some pain that's happening from time to time. And of course, with two broke wrists and a broke nose and all the trauma from, from a fall like she had this past weekend, that's to be expected. But we're glad that she's, uh, she's resting a little bit better and, 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 and doing well. So uh, she's uh, praying for good days for her. Uh, they are going to be able to see the, the orthopedic specialist here at the end of this week, so that's a that's a, a praise, and we're thankful to God for working that out. It was going to be a little later, but they got that moved up. So praying that when he looks at her or she looks at her, whoever that orthopedic surgeon is, that, uh, that there will be no more complications and that they'll have a clear plan to, uh, to help her get casts on and, and continue that healing process. Uh, pray for Marley as school gets started with her friends and things like that. And, and with her too, obviously this throws a big monkey wrench into going back to school and what was already going to be and what will be for so many of them. A tough year to begin with, just strange with different schedule and different expectations and different precautions, more hoops to jump through and things like that and protecting each other from the virus. But but pray for Marley that, that she'll be encouraged in all this. This is a, that's a tough time going into seventh grade, and, and uh, you know that's a, that's a very important time, and, and, uh, but it can be a tough time, especially when you have an injury like this, and she won't be able to do so many of the things that she likes to do. So pray for Marley. Pray for Angela, for Rowdy, for the rest of the family there as, uh, as they take care of Marley, and uh, pray for Marley's healing as well. Uh, you just see uh, under our cancer patients, there's a new um, addition there, June Goodson. Uh, the, June comes to us through Haley Smith, and uh, it's a request that Haley gave to us uh, this week in the office. Uh, June is a little girl who has relapsed with leukemia. Uh, that, that's all I know about, about June's situation, but that's enough to be able to pray for. So pray for June Goodson, little girl suffering with leukemia uh, again, and uh, has come back into leukemia. Leukemia has come back on her, uh, better said. So, uh, But pray for them, uh, for her and her family, and uh, obviously uh, when it comes to cancer, especially leukemia amongst children, uh, it's just a, a, a terrible disease that, that is so dreaded and so tough. Uh, pray for God's miraculous hand uh, for him to work as only he can through her, her doctors and her nurses and her physicians in every way. Uh, and, and pray for encouragement for her and her family for that little girl. What about you this evening? Who, uh, who, who would you add? Who would you update us on? Take just a second to do that below right here in the comments. All right, well, wherever you are, let's take just a couple of minutes to, uh, to pray. If you're around people that you can get with, uh, then circle up and pray. If not, you can pray right there to the Lord yourself, and he will hear us and answer according to his will. Let's pray together this evening.
Lord God, you are great and you are wonderful. You are above all things. You are over all things. And nothing goes on without your uh, allowance and, Father, without your will being worked through it. So, Lord God, we ask for each of these, each of these folks that we love dearly and that we, that we know so very well in some cases and don't know very well, but, Lord, you've given us a, the ability through your love for us to love them. Father, we ask, Lord, that you would work your will in their lives, that you would bring about peace and strength and comfort. Lord God, that you would help each and every one of them. And uh, Lord, that you would, you would move miraculously. God, that you would wipe away all of their pain, all of their diseases. God, if you choose to do so, we'll praise you. But if you choose not to do that, if you choose to heal them incrementally, uh, Father, if you choose not to heal them, Father, in any way, Lord, we'll praise you still. Father, of course, our thoughts are that we would love you to, uh, to, to make it all easy. But, Father, you work even through the darkest of times. And, God, you're working now. Father, we ask, Lord, that in, in all of that, you would let us have faith in you and grow our faith in you, that we would not dread the hard times, but rather look to see what you're doing in them. Help us, Father, in our families. Help us in what we do and who we are. Lord, to honor you in every way. And we thank you, Father, that you give us that chance and that opportunity through Jesus Christ. Let us trust him with all of our hearts, for it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, this evening, uh, I'm going to talk about something we all absolutely deal with. If, uh, if, if you've put your faith in Christ this evening, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Christ, then uh, this, uh, what we're about to read from the book of Romans chapter 7 uh, is absolutely going to apply to you. Uh, and if you say it doesn't, well, then it does because you're lying. Because uh, guess what? This is something that all of us deal with. Uh, there's, no, uh, there's no bonus points for being super Christian and acting like everything in our life is perfect, like we, not, we don't have temptation and we don't follow that temptation from time to time or very often sometimes. Uh, there, there's no, there, God's not looking down on us and saying, okay, well, these are the good Christians and these are the ones that aren't. I mean, we, we've invented this idea of a good Christian. But here's the thing. Every single one of us as followers of Christ, we still live here in the flesh. Uh, our flesh has been overcome and eternally will be overcome in salvation. Our sin has been beaten, forgiven. We have been redeemed through the blood of Christ and we have been empowered through his power over death and all things. But we still live in this old skin. We still are susceptible to disease and to illness and to death. We're still susceptible to falling to temptation and sinning even in our saved existence. Now, that we, we hopefully know for each and every one of us that salvation, while we're still in the flesh, does not mean that we uh, act perfect and do everything right every time. That is absolutely what we're striving to. We're striving to be holy as the Lord is holy because he's given us that opportunity through the power and the sealing of his Holy Spirit. But we're not going to get it. It's, it's, it's something that we can't do on our own. And we have the encouragement of Scripture that God continues to work in us and teach us in those times that we are tempted, in those times that we are tested, whether we pass the test or resist the temptation as, as he calls us to, or whether we fall into it. Now, that doesn't mean that God is happy with our sin. He never is. In fact, the sin that we commit after we're saved is what is also contributory to our need that we had to be saved. If that makes sense, um, the, the sin that we've had, Christ has already died for. He already knew we were going to commit it, and, we, and he, he knew that he was going to save us from it if he, we have already indeed been saved. That doesn't mean, and Romans talks about this, that we should just go on and say, well, hey, we're covered by grace, so let's just keep on sinning. I mean, we got a free pass. We got a get out of jail free card. Let's just keep on doing it. That's not the attitude of a saved person. But also, a saved person also shouldn't have the attitude that, well, I'm saved and I'm a Christian, so I don't ever mess up anymore. That's just simply a lie. That's just simply a, a delusion. That's simply being deceived uh, by something that's not true. And here's how we know this, because in Romans chapter 7, we read that the Apostle Paul, uh, who I, I would put up against any of our faith, his faith, any day of the week, uh, certainly against my own. I mean, some of you may, may think you could hold your own against Paul, but I, th I feel like Paul, uh, by, by knowing Jesus the way he knew him, meeting Jesus the way he met him, and living for Christ the way that he lived for him, I feel like Paul is an example. I believe that God has allowed him to be set up for that. He's not, he is not uh, at the level of Jesus by any stretch of the imagination, but certainly when it comes to living out faith, Paul is someone I trust because God entrusted to him to write so many of the words that have shaped the faith that I live and the faith that you live in Christ today according to his word. 
So in, in chapter 7 of Romans, uh, and Romans is, is explaining so much, it's comparing uh, grace to the law and making sure that we're not just still trying to check off boxes or obey a list or trying to measure ourselves by the law, but rather we measure ourselves by Christ and what he has done and what he does in our life. But Paul gets very real here when he's talking about the law and sin and how the law was made to point out sin and to show the, the, the futility of us trying to get to God or be worthy of, of salvation on our own uh, and to put our faith in Christ. And here's what he says in Romans chapter 7, starting with verse 14. He says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, uh, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do, uh, excuse me, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Now, as you even heard me stumble a little bit as I read, there's a lot of the word do in this passage. The word do, do, in other words, the action of, of committing action, um, is, is so much repeated and so very repetitive in this passage. Uh, and, and, and I think that that's important because we've got to focus on not just what we believe in our heart, that's where salvation begins, but as we got to share with a couple of our, our uh, uh, young, well, young students uh, or older children, depending on which way you want to look at it this week, um, you know, the Bible tells us that, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then, then we're saved. There's a two-part thing to that, and it's referencing two parts of us. Believing in our heart is, is the inside, and confessing with our mouth is the outside. And so this idea of what I do and what I don't want to do that I do anyway in this sinful nature is very much shown by what we do on the outside. Now, for me and you, a lot of us, we would say that, no, on the inside, much like Paul said towards the end of that passage, we, we delight in what God says. We, we love his word. We, we love what he calls us to do, and, and that's what we want to do, but we run into this problem that what we end up actually doing on a daily basis and throughout each day doesn't always line up with what's in our heart, with what we believe. And so this evening, just very briefly, let's take a look at what Paul says here and, and what he's talking about. He says in verse 14, he says, we know the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. So what does that mean? Well, first off, of course, apart from Christ, we're all slaves to sin until we find our freedom in Christ. Once we find our freedom in Christ, though, he doesn't immediately sweep us up, resurrect our body, and, resur and redeem our soul uh, for, for heaven. Uh, he, he does save us, and he does give us that redemption, but we still stay right here on this earth in this same fleshly body that was so used to living for sin and living as a slave to sin. And so this, this duality, this back and forth, this, this yin and yang, for lack of a better analogy there, I don't want to get too far Eastern on you, but, but, but this, 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 this day and night type of thing is going on and it wars within our soul. We've read that uh, from scripture in, in our sermons here lately. It wars within our soul. And so that's the battle that we fight as God continues in our salvation to refine us and glorify us until the point where he wipes away sin and it makes it no more. We live in that time and in that tension where salvation and sin is right here. We're 
both spiritual and unspiritual at the same time. Well, he's talking about the law being spiritual. Of course, the law applies to spiritual truths being lived out in physical and, and, and attitude actions and, and thoughts and beliefs and things like that. He says, we know the law is spiritual, but I'm unspiritual, a slave to, sold as a slave to sin. He, in verse 15, he starts to talk about what he does. He says, I do not understand what I do. Can we just agree for most of us, if not all of us, that we don't always understand what we do. I know in my life, I want to be holy as Christ is holy. I want to please God in what I do, but I find myself battling not to harbor ill will, not to harbor bad attitudes, not to commit sins that, I, that I've struggled with and new sins that temptation would draw me into. It's a daily battle and it keeps me on my toes and it helps me to grow as I do battle with Christ by my side and with Christ even fighting for me and the power of the Holy Spirit at work in me. I, I don't understand though why I don't do better. I don't understand why I do what I do. And Paul's saying that's true for him. Now, it'd be easy at this point to say, well, hey, if it's true for Paul and he wrote a lot of the New Testament, well, we're okay. Well, we are okay if we've put our faith in Christ, but it doesn't mean that we can't learn to be better in this battle, to be better in this fight, to, to glorify God a step or several steps more in fighting this temptation. He says, I do not know what I want, uh, what, uh, excuse me, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. What he's saying here is I want to do what glorifies God, but I find myself so often doing the opposite, doing the things that do not glorify God. And he says in verse 16, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. Well, why would that be? Because the law is there to point out how holy God is so that we can compare ourselves to that. When we compare ourselves to Christ, who is the fulfillment of the law, and, but it's understandable that, that we would also look at the, I mean, we can't discount the law. It's not that the law is gone. It's been completed. And so we have the law and we have the gospels, uh, which teach us the life of Christ. And we have the rest of the New Testament that teaches us how to live that faith in him out. And so what he's saying here is, is when I do what I don't want to do, it's good that I have the law because now instead of trying to check off a list, I'm learning more. Okay, this is what I need to work on. This is the area that I'm failing in. This is the area that I'm strong in. This is the areas that I'm weak in. And so he says that because of that, when I do what I don't want to do, I agree that the law is good. In verse 17, he says, as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. And here's where that tension is present in all of our lives. God, through our salvation, when we put our faith and our trust and our lives in Jesus Christ, he makes us a new creation, but he makes that new creation to live in the same physical body as the old one did. If you think back to when you gave your life to Christ, certainly within your spirit, things changed and, and within your desires, things began to change. But very quickly, temptation jumped right back in to attack that change. Almost like a, a, a good uh, bacteria trying to grow in your body and your body trying to fight it off because it's different and it's new and it's been introduced. In that, Christ imputes into us his righteousness. And so literally we live today with the righteousness, not of ourselves and what we do, but of Christ and what he has done being given to us. But he says, though, it's no longer I that sin. In other words, it's not the new creation. It's not Christ's power and Christ's righteousness that's committing sin. It's the fact that we still are at war with this flesh. This, this skin, this, this, this physicality that has so much uh, in the way of limitations and is subject even to death. He says, it's no longer me, it's sin living in me. And so that's the tension that we have Christ living in us, but we also have the propensity and the habit of sin still at work in us. And so the two are fighting uh, and warring over our very souls. He says in verse 18, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me, uh, not in me by myself. It's only through Christ that dwells in me. He says, it does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. In other words, in the part of us that is still prone to sin, well, that's not good. That's not, and, and we don't need to try to do good out of that part. We need to tap into, we need to follow, we need to grow in understanding the, the righteousness that Christ has put in us. He says I, I, that, that good doesn't dwell in me on the sinful side of things and the sinful nature of things and, that is still present within me. He says, for I have the desire to do what is good, which comes from and which is originated by Christ within us. I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. 
He says, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. You know, I think it's... I think it's naive for us. I think it's unrealistic for us. And I think it's even, according to God's word, just purely patently false for us to believe that once we get saved, we just don't sin anymore. Because now Christ is in my life and, and I'm, I'm good. I, I'll never have to worry about sin again. No, because Christ is in my life, I know the difference between righteousness and sin. And I'm learning the difference more and more each day. Each passing moment, he's teaching me more of how holy he is and how unholy I by myself could be. And we'll see that again in what Paul's going to say here in just a couple of verses. But we have that tension. We have that fight going on that, uh, that I don't do what I want to do, but the evil I don't want to do, that I keep on doing. Folks, that's present in all of us. We all battle that. And we're all at different places in our battle with that not just based on the time since we've been saved, but based on what we've done with that time and based on what we're doing with the day that is today, the, the day that he's given us to, to, to serve him and to worship him. Not a one of us is above sin, not yet. While sin is still in existence and we still draw breath, sin is still in our nature. Christ has beat it eternally, but temporally right now, we're still, he's still fighting with us in the battle against him. In verse 20, we read, Now if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it's sin living in me that does it. The goal here is to lean more into and follow more after Christ who lives with us than to do what we would do on our own and to do what our sin nature tells us to do. It doesn't mean that in keeping score that we need to get discouraged, but rather we need to find our encouragement to know that through Christ alone and through the power of his Holy Spirit, we will overcome sin, uh, but it, it's a battle. It's something that's going on. It's something that we have to keep fighting in. He says in verse 21, so I find this law at work. In other words, in seeing all this, this I see to be true. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. How many times in the midst of doing good have we made it evil by making it selfish, by doing things uh, in, in a self-centered way or in a way that we're worried about more how it affects us than it affects those who we might be serving or doing for evil and, and good still exist. There'll be a time when evil will exist no more. The judgment will happen and God will, will wipe all, away all the tears and all the disease. And for those who are in him, that life of perfection, we will live in him for all of eternity. And we can't wait to get there, but we're not there yet. Evil and good are still in, at war, even within the souls of those who are saved. We know where the, where the war is going to be won. We know that the war has been won, but we're still fighting the battles. He says in verse 22, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law. The only way we can do that is to be saved. That's how we know he's speaking to believers at this point, not, not unbelievers, because no unbeliever, no person who's yet to put their faith in Christ will delight in God's law because as the scripture tells us, God's law and the gospel that comes from it will be foolishness to them. They won't delight in it, but when we have Christ within us, when he has saved us and his Holy Spirit is covering us and sealing us, he allows us the opportunity and the ability to delight in his law. He says, for in my inner being, in other words, for what Christ has done at my core, I, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. In other words, this is just, he's, he's observing. Kind of like, think about this like the law of gravity. These are the laws he's discovering that, that are constantly true, uh, no matter what we do. Gravity is always there in the places we go. Uh, unless we enter into space or, or enter into a situation where gravity has been artificially uh, overcome, we are dealing with gravity at every point and every turn, every step, everything we do. These, these are the laws that he's talking about, that this law of the sin nature versus the Christ nature that, that is at war within our souls, that this law is that it's reality. It's what we're dealing with for each and every one of us. Listen to what he says as a result of understanding this and sharing it. He says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And here's the good news. <laughs> so far, you've been several verses and gone, man, is this going to get better? Is this going to get more encouraging? Here it is. And here's the, here's the sinker. Here's the, you know, here's, here's the kicker. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our deliverance is in the side of us that is, that is in Christ. In other words, it's in the spiritual side. It's in the side that delights in God's law. That is where our deliverance comes from eternally, but that is also where our deliverance will come from in each and every moment and each and every temptation 
and in the grace and forgiveness when we fall to temptation. And that law is also true. That law of God is also there and is, that, is reality in what we're facing. He says, so then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. So here's the thing, folks. If this evening you've put your faith in Christ, you, uh, you, you're dealing with the parts of you that are slaves to different masters. We have submitted to be slaves to God's law. We've given up our rights. We've given up our possessions. We've given up our very time and our very life to serve him. And that's what salvation entails. That's what he calls us to do. He says uh, those who give up their life will find it. Well, that's what we're talking about. We can't just say, well, I want to do exactly what I want to do, but I want to be saved too. It doesn't work that way. That's not salvation. If that's how we look at things, then we're, we may not be saved, to be honest with you. And we need to wrestle with that in our lives. But if we have truly given our life to Christ, submitted ourselves to Christ, we're still battling the sin nature on the daily basis that we live. And we're still dealing with that all the time. And so I encourage you to be, be aware of that. Many of you are saying, look, Rich, I've been aware of that longer than you've been alive. Many of you are saying, Rich, I get that. I am in that fight. Man, encourage me. Help me. Well, here's the encouragement. Christ wins. He will win. He does win. And he can win in each and every battle. Wherever God allows us to be tempted, he allows and provides for us to have victory. Basically, he puts that choice in our hands. Because we've given our life to Christ. Christ is present within us. So we're a slave to Christ. We're a slave to God. And we want to do what is right in him. But we're battling against the sin nature that we're also a slave to, but he gives us the power to overcome it. And that's how we can measure how we're growing. Are we growing in a way that whatever it is, however we're studying God's word, however we're praying to him, however we're attending and serving in church and doing the things that he's called us to do in, in, in those areas, we can judge whether or not we're growing by how's that fight going back and forth. Now, we all hit seasons where we fall into temptation more than we overcome it. But how often do those seasons come along and how close together are they? Is that the characteristic of our whole life is that we're living out this season where we keep letting sin win? Well, sometimes we, we may be in that. And we need to ask ourselves, you know, what, what's, what's going on in my faith? Or well, some of us have experienced and all of us can experience those times where we're doing really, really well. Those sins that we used to commit often they're few and far between, or maybe we've just overcome them. And those sins that would emerge in our life, we've allowed Christ to head off of the past. I pray for each and every one of us, Harrisville, that we would be growing in him. That it won't be until we, we are no longer in this body, but in our resurrected body and, and present with the Lord for all of eternity that we don't have to fight this battle anymore. But in the meantime, I pray that he'd help us to fight well and to his glory. He will, if we'll but follow him and be obedient to him. And when we fall to temptation, he's not up there ready to beat us up, so we don't need to beat ourselves up. But we need to get up, dust, or better yet, no, not dust ourselves off, but let him dust us off and get right back on the path, get right back in the race, get right back in the fight, fighting for God's glory to be made manifest in our life through Christ who is within us. Let's pray together. Lord God, we are not perfect yet. We're saved by you, but we won't be perfect till this flesh is gone and this battle and these battles that make up this war are over with. God, we thank you for the promise that that day is coming according to your timeline and only your timeline. We can't predict it. We won't know it. But when it happens, it is real and it will be real for all of eternity. In the meantime, God, help us to follow your son, Jesus Christ, through the power of your Holy Spirit to your glory, God. Help us to love you by living out what you've put right out ahead of us and the opportunity that you've given us. God, help us to find our victory little by little and look forward to the victory that will be total and eternal that is coming. Thank you for salvation. If there's anyone out there this evening who's not put their faith in Christ or who realizes that maybe they've just done some churchy things, they've never really trusted Jesus as their Savior and Lord, then let, them, let the, their hearts not rest until they come to finish that part of the business with you. Lord, so help them talk to you, pray to you, reach out to others who they will find good and trusted and true counsel from and ask those questions about what they're going through. But God, bring them to salvation. And as we are saved, Father, help us to follow you. Thank you for the victory that comes only through you. And give us that each day as we trust you in the daily parts of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Church family, we do love you. We hope you have a great rest of the week. If there's anything we can do for you, give us a call. Um, if there's anything that we can bring to you or go get for you, anything, any way we can help you at all, let us know. We're praying for each and every one of you and praying that God is being glorified in your daily life. And we know that he is being glorified in what you do here because you do things so well. So we hope you have a great rest of the week. God bless you.